Hey folks, four more to go and then I can take a break. <laughs> yeah, this has been good doing this series and you guys have been very supportive, but I'm, let's just say I'm in big, big plans for trying to upgrade the podcast, to check out live streaming, to, you know, improve on certain bits of my videos and that. And so I've got a lot of prepping and experimentation to do, which needs time. So the daily content will stop after these shelf by shelf videos are done because I kind of need the time. And you know, I, for example, I've just spent the last five and a half hours learning how to use open broadcaster software, OBS. I've done a whole Udemy course on it. So the information's in here and now I need to record a video in order to have a video for today. So it's kind of like, I need to get it done. But once these shelf by shelf ones are done, then the daily heat will stop and then it will go back to normal frequency and until I relaunch a few things. So shelf 47, two more normal shelves and then the top of each shelf, which I'll have to figure out how I'm going to do those, but uh, we'll, I'll figure it out pretty soon. But for now, let's get these last two of the calyx done. So let's start off nice and simple here. These games, the Omniverse series, now I'm not going to go into too much detail over each, but um, basically this series of solo games is like really cool. I mean, you can play them two-player co-op, but I prefer solo and most people do. But there's several of these done by Sh uh, Shadi Tobe, I believe is the name, and printed by Z-Man Games, and they're basically just lots of different solo games in my mind, and they're really good fun. Now, some I like better than others. I have played Castellum. Uh, it was it was okay. I wasn't a massive fan, but I thought it was okay. Uh, I have I have not played uh, what was it called Nautilus or Naution. I really want to play that one Nautilion, and I have played Urbian. That uh, was a bit of a letdown as well. But these are my three picks in order. I would say my favorite, if I was to consider all three on a, as a whole, would probably be. Arion. Arion is kind of a Yahtzee style dice game. You're, you're trying to build several airships and in order to build the airships you've got to do them like ship, crew and uh, blueprint or something again. You've got to do them in order but you take them, the cards from decks and you roll Yahtzee style to try and get pairs and three of a kind and you know three pairs and four of a kind that kind of thing in order to collect the cards. There's some mini expansions as well to increase the difficulty and change it up a notch but it's a super simple but pretty cool solo game and to consider that this one gives me the most fun for the pretty good level of simplicity I have to go with this one as being my favorite. Now the other two is a bit more harder to tell because if you ask me for which one is the easier to get to the table, it would be Oniram. Oniram is like the classic one with all these mini expansions in there. I haven't even tried them all. And it's essentially a big solitaire style deck shuffler extreme game. The app does a lot better for it. And you're trying to collect these doors and unlock them in order to get out of the dream world. And you're trying to play cards in sequence to do so. A lot of luck in this one, believe me. But... You've got these nightmares that keep coming up and screwing over your hand, screwing over your deck, and if you run out of your deck, you lose. It's, it's a lot of ways to lose, and I'm pretty bad at this one. I feel I can win Aerion pretty well, but, you know, you up it to harder difficulties and it's a lot harder. This one I struggle with. I don't know why. It just seems to, whatever, like, flummox me as, well, my luck is pretty bad in games, so that could be a good reason, but I still like it. But this one might be my favorite from a gameplay perspective. It's harder to get this one to the table and it is a bigger table hog. But this is an underrated one for Sylveon. This one has kind of like a game of two halves. The second half is a tower defense style game, a bit like Plants vs. Zombies layout, where you've got the rows and columns and the elemental comes in from the side and you've got to get it back, you know, get it back with these animals and waterfalls and that. But the first part of the game is a mini draft deck builder in a sense. You have these columns of cards with all these creatures in that you're going to use to battle against this fire elemental and you create your starting deck by drafting from these columns and some will go away, some you can keep and you've got to go like, oh, I don't know, uh, that column's got some nice cards in it but that one's got the uber card and I really want it but nope, must go for this, I'll lose it, I'll deal with it. And so when you start the tower defense bit, the deck is unique to every game. You've chosen a complete different composition of your deck. And it's a really neat underrated one, this. It's just a bit harder to remember all the rules. It's a very hard game to win <laughs> in general. And, you know, it just requires a little bit of extra thought compared to the other two, which maybe don't require as much thought. But I like these three. These are easily my, like, top three Omniverse games. And honestly, if you're interested in solo gaming, you owe it to yourself to check out this series. Regardless of which ones you prefer, even if it's not one of these three, check out the series. Alrighty. 
Now we're going on the heavy, like really heavy. So this could be, I believe, my favorite Uwe Rosenberg game. And I could be right on that. Caverna comes a close second, but this one definitely is my favorite, I think. And this is the whopping big Fields of Arl. Fields of Arl with the tea and trade expansion, which is in a separate box. But Fields of Arl, oh, I uh, love this one. This one is a basically sandbox Euro the game. That is what essentially this is. And with Fields of Arl, it's got that feeling of Caverna and Agricola where you build up your farm and, you know, get animals, get crops, go get buildings, that kind of thing. But it's so sandbox, it's unreal because you have this huge field with dikes at the end for flooding. You've got, uh, you know, flax and corn and you've got the animals of horses and cows and stuff. And, uh, I think horses, I don't know, but cows and sheep maybe. Uh, you've got the peat at the bottom and the bogs that you've got to dehydrate and get out. There's a lot of stuff you can do in this game and it's a point salad at the end of the day. So you are getting points for pretty much everything you do. But what I love is the worker placement is done in two halves. The sort of kind of like summer and winter, might as well call them. And you get a set of actions in the summer and a different set in the winter and you alternate between two from round to round. On top of that, each of these actions is linked by a tool and with the tools, when you let, for example, the axe, you you go to the wood chopper action in summer and you get to chop two wood. Okay, cool, I can use that to get a building later. But if you spend time and gain points by upgrading the axe via another space, then when you go to the axe cutter later, you can go, oh, now I only get, now I get four wood every time I go there. And it's like, that's more efficient. I can really stock up the wood now without having to go there so often. And you can do that with this huge realm of skills. and. It just means that you can play this game in such a different way every single time. The problem, it only goes up to two players. And to be honest, I pretty much play this solo. However, if I do want to play it multiplayer, there is tea and trade. Tea and trade, this expansion ups it to three players and gives you a new rule for how to balance out the time length for adding a third player. In fact, this rule is so good that I, I will throw it into a two player if I can, because it basically allows you to start off with a tool upgrade and a building. So you've already got like a little bit of a setup for your strategy as well as, you know, you've kickstarted the length a little bit. So it shortens it down. And I think you play one less round anyway in a free player. But with tea and trade, as if you didn't think that operating your farm and upgrading your tools and going to the local villages and getting vehicles and horse and carts and that, if you thought that was too much, now you've got tea, which you can feed to your worker in a sense in order to get him to do a more powerful action or do things twice you've got trading with different countries you've got even more vehicles like boats that you can make oh my god you put these two together and you create the ultimate euro sandbox and for that reason i love this game i mean i like the game without it but shove it in and it's brilliant you know i can do whatever i like i want to just take a farm do what i like with it here you go fields of all tea and trade no restrictions other than typical rules of where I can put a worker and that kind of thing. But in terms of, right, do you want to do nothing but sheep farming? Go for it. You want to clear your entire dike out and put buildings already? Go ahead. Uh, you want to say, forget buildings. You just want to upgrade all your tools and be a tool master. Okay, fair enough. You want to get all this peat and then use it to do other things. Okay, fair enough. You want to go trading with India? Yeah, go on. You want to trade with your local village and get that all the way to the max track? Yeah, whatever. You want to stockpile all these? You can do literally anything you like. Well, the choice is yours. <laughs> and I love it. All right, put that over there. Now for the next big one. <laughs> oh, now this one is usually most people's favorite uh, Uwe Rosenberg game, and fair enough. But this is probably my third favorite, I would say. Uh, if we're going if we're going by the big box stuff alone, yeah, I would say this is my third favorite. Caverna beats this one out, and it almost fell off the top 100 list before I got Norwegians for it. More on that in a minute. But Feast of Odin, Feast of Odin. This one is, whoo, this is a whopping great big box, and I've got to be careful with the insert and sides. There's a lot of pieces, but yeah, this is the worker placement to end all worker placement games because. <laughs> With Feast of Odin, you basically have about 60 different spaces you can go to in order to do the usual thing of collect resources and get buildings and go shipping and raiding and hunt and all sorts of like, you know, almost sandbox point salad stuff. But with this, it combines that worker placement with the polyomino thing that Uri Rosenberg has a thing for. And you're building 
like a sort of Tetris layout with all the stuff that you're collecting in order to get rid of, you know, gain more points or gain more bonuses. So theme is a bit stronger in fee in um T tra sorry, the Fields of Arl and Caverna than it is in this one, because why are we putting everything in a Tetris format? But it's very thinky, you've got a lot of choices of what to do, and it's a good rewarding experience. But it nearly fell off my top 100, and fanboys of this game will, you know, dispute this, and fair enough, you know, if, you know, different opinions. But I don't believe the strategies are varied enough in the original version of Feast for Odin, because you've got several ways you can play it, but there's probably a good couple that are, like, like, well, yeah, these two are really popular to do, and then there's also one in here which is just complete, well, two in here which are complete rubbish. You've got the sheds and storage things, which, if you try and focus on them, won't get you the victory. But you also got animals in here that you can collect. I have yet to see anybody win with an animal strategy in this game, ever. Like, never have I seen animals win. I can only imagine you could do it if you are an expert in this game and you're playing against complete noobs to work a placement, let alone Feast of Odin. I mean, to work a placement. And then you might be able to get animals to win. But no, it, you know, that bit was well, a little bit of a problem for me, but otherwise, fine. But then you throw in. Norwegians and lots of people are clambering to get this expansion in there and this is what brings it back into the top 100 for me because it, it rejuvenates like the board and balances a few elements of it which is great but it introduces like a unique shed uh, storage thing that you have at the start of the game which is different from everybody else's you can ignore it or you can go for it it balances out some of the stuff like the raiding and the emigration but it also really ups the value of animals because the entire row for worker spaces for animals and the mechanics are like fundamentally changed you've got way more choice and suddenly focusing on animals is actually a legit strategy that can win so having this as well as some of the other little extras it has for spaces and a column where if you put a worker on it it's very powerful but it's the last one you must do in a round stuff like that is really good intense thinking but other than that, it's pretty easy to integrate into the game, and I will never teach this without Norwegians. You know, I just think the game has vastly improved by it. But, you know, people will dispute that this is not an essential expansion. I probably wouldn't say it was essential, but I would certainly say it's high on your must-get list for this game, you know. But, you know, people have got different opinions on it. Personally, I'm one for the Norwegians. And I know there's a couple of people who watch my channel now and again who will be more than pleased that I say those words. <laughs> so, fair play. Anyway, that's it for Shelf 47. One more. One more square. We are done with Z-Man Games and we are moving on to a bit of a mix. A bit of a mix for the last one, a, a jack of all trades. And then we're on to the tops of the shelves. So, uh, three more to go, guys. Better enjoy them because I'm not doing the shelf by shelf thing again. Not unless the collection goes through a fundamental change, because I don't think I don't think this is going to like change for the dramatic sense that will require me to do another shelf by shelf video. I just can't sort of see how that would work. So I'll see you a square number forty eight. So I do like it, but it nearly fell off my top one hundred because. It was getting a little bit repetitive over what strategies I liked because, and fanboys, sorry, ah, bit my lip. Mm -hmm.